Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Bassam Haddad of George Mason University. Um, <clears throat> to the cameras, I'm actually standing up, so. <laughs> Um, I'll um, I'll try to be um, a bit um, a bit brief because uh, I have to go to the bathroom. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit disappointing because it's not really about revolution, and uh, I think uh, some of us who have been uh, well, all of us who have been glued to the TV and and the print press um, uh, have have gotten a good deal of of, of analysis uh, on the basics. So I will actually be addressing reform, economic reform, and how it got us in part to where we are today. So I'll be talking about reform and social polarization in Egypt. We have been witnessing a magnificent set of developments in Egypt that many of us did not see coming, at least not this fast. My recent work uh, on the political economy of Egypt um, and its growing social unrest <coughs> uh, has focused on issues that uh, we are seeing today on the streets. Um, and these are uh, outcomes of uh, various kinds of uh, reforms that I'll be addressing. But I never thought it would have this much relevance so quickly. The topic uh, of social polarization is right front and center of what is happening today in Egypt. It's just that we're not talking about it very much. In fact, analysts rush to dismiss economic factors as though those who are positing them are assuming that they are single-handedly uh, producing the outcomes, and they are not. It's just an important and um, uh, crucial factor. As we are inundated with news on the Egyptian uprising and revolution, you pick your uh, term, it would be good to take pause and consider a history that both illuminates the effects of economic reform on mass mobilization, uh, on, sorry, uh, on mass mobilization there, whether or not this uprising took place. In other words, I could have uh, presented this uh, a bit earlier, and it might actually be relevant to other um, countries in the region and beyond. So here in my talk, you will not hear very much about revolution. Instead, uh, you will hear a history that is replicated in many other cases in developing countries, but has salience in several Arab regimes undergoing reforms. And of course, Tunisia here comes to mind. The caveat that I want to start with is that social polarization did not single-handedly, I want to stress, uh, produce the uprising. It is one uh, element without which we cannot understand the magnitude of what's happening. We have the tendency to focus on the matters on the surface, and I will try to dig back a bit underneath, and it will be, uh, I promise you, it will be quite boring. <clears throat> Beginning in 1991, the World Bank and the IMF Economic Reform and Structural Adjustment Program, uh, I will uh, henceforth uh, say ERSAP, Economic Reform and Structural Adjustment Program, was implemented to manage the Egyptian financial crisis and remove, implementation, remove impediments to future growth by putting an end to state management of the economy through market liberalization, privatization, budget deficit uh, reduction, and infusion of foreign investment capital and a shift towards an export-oriented economy. While these reform efforts were intended to improve Egypt's macroeconomic health, very little consideration was given to the effect these policies would have, would have on, on, upon society, including the impact on unemployment, poverty, and the redistribution of political and, and economic power. In practice, ERSAP succeeded in reducing the state's explicit role in managing the economy, privatizing state-owned assets, and attracting foreign investment. However, the reforms also succeeded in creating greater social polarization between rich and poor, and this is an understatement, deteriorated living, deteriorated living standards for most Egyptians, and resulted in uneven geographic and sectoral development throughout the country that ver further exacerbated the negative side effects of reform. This is why what we're witnessing is not something that's happening centrally in Cairo or in the metropolitan cities. It's actually happening in the cities and in the countryside. Karim. There certainly is a debate regarding what exactly caused the failure. Uh, is it the policies themselves or the obstacles to implementation related to the nature of the regime in Egypt? But this calls into question the nature of these prescriptions in light of the very same obstacles that any cursory review of the playing field would have made clear in advance. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, evidence from the research uh, of economists and practitioners, including people like Francois Bourguignon, who are uh, connected with the World Bank and actually was the former vice president of the World Bank, suggests that outcomes related to inequity and social polarization are not explained wholly by policy implementation. In other words, the corruption of the regime or the authoritarian nature of the regime or even simply elite capture of these uh, policies, although it, they play a big role. We must go back to the drawing board that emphasized trickle-down economics and uh, over and against uh, various forms of uh, equitable development. Within a few years after 91, Egypt had managed to drastically reduce its budget deficits and uh, control some of the macroeconomic imbalances. I will not list them. The state accomplished this not by managing the economy better or adopting new innovating te innovative techniques, but by fundamentally altering the social contract between state and society. Prior to the 1990s, the state in Egypt took responsibility to dispense state resources to the people, including welfare services, employment, health, and education, and income support such as subsidies. In return, the population was somewhat acquiescent vis-a-vis -vis the regime, though this did not happen across the board. While unemployment and poverty were abundant, these conditions were mitigated by the existence of a state support of a state support apparatus that provided a broad safety net that, that prevented many of the uh, many from falling into the depth of abject poverty. Ursa policies, structural adjustment policies, while improving macroeconomic conditions, stripped away the safety net by weakening social welfare programs to a great degree and continuously so since then, rolling back consumer subsidies, eliminating employment guarantees, and through, sub and through privatization programs, enlarged private sector employment that contributed to lower wages, lower benefits, and higher unemployment ultimately. Reforms to agricultural policy are also very important because they affect, of course, the countryside. They're particularly illustrative of the ways in which uh, these policies, or ERSAP, have fundamentally altered the state-society relationship while also contributing to a growing polarization of, this, uh, of society between the winners and the losers uh, from economic reform. At the forefront of economic liberalization was agriculture. Among the first measures to be implemented was the new, was the new tenancy measure, the notorious Law 96 of 1992, that brought the end to tenancy guarantees and rent ceilings for farmers. While the government argued that reforming the tenancy law would lead to greater agricultural productivity, in reality, such measures were motivated more by the desire to open the agricultural sector to market forces and reverse Nasser era state interventionist policies. When the law came into effect, rents jumped significantly, sometime, sometimes as much as 400% and became prohibitively high for most tenants. Thus, as the agricultural sector has been privatized and run according to market forces rather than state management, there have been no significant improvements in productivity, nor have such reforms resulted in lower unemployment or poverty. Instead, or lower poverty or lowered poverty. Instead, agricultural reforms or ag agricultural reforms have led to a greater social differentiation and rural land landlessness resulting from dispossession of small far, um, holders. Can I have the water, please? I'm a bit under the weather, I apologize. With high unemployment and poverty rates in the countryside, many sought work in the manufacturing sector in what is already a strained urban labor market. Those that lack the experience skills or personal connections necessary for securing unemployment unemploy find themselves with few options. The fundamental reason as to why there, exist, there exists macroeconomic growth alongside growing rates of poverty and, un and unemployment is because of the staunch adherence to market liberalization and privatization and the abrupt removal of the state from economic management. That has been the goal of economic reform. It has not been. It has been the elevi It has not been the alleviation of poverty or improvements to Egyptians' quality of life, but rather the transformation of the economy according to certain standards that don't necessarily benefit Egyptians or people in late developing countries. To understand why economic reform has resulted in social polarization rather than poverty reduction, it is helpful to apply. Uh, for instance, Bourguignon's Poverty Growth Inequality Triangle, which states that effective development strategy involving policies that address both economic distribution and, and achieve aggregate uh, 
income growth. In the case of Egypt, we see that neither of these policies were being promoted in a way that would reduce poverty uh, or alleviate social polarization. Agriculture reforms have redistributed land holdings, but concentrated them in the hands of wealthy landowners while dispossessing many small-scale farmers that we see today as part of what uh, is happening in Egypt. Similarly, there is no evidence of aggregate income growth at all in Egypt. Economic sectors responsible for macroeconomic growth have been those with low, with low employment, such as oil and gas extraction, tourism and services, all benefiting a very, a very small handful of people that are now, uh, you know, we hear about them in the news, people like Ahmad Az and others. Although Ahmad Az has become a cliche, um, but there are many, many uh, faceless others. High employment uh, sectors such as agriculture and manufacturing have seen their contribution to economic growth decline uh, considerably. The benefits of macroeconomic growth have not positively affected workers or society as a whole, but have been concentrated, but have been concentrated among small economic sectors in terms of person power. Poverty has not been alleviate, alleviated either. Instead, it has increased from 17% of the population in 2000 to at least 20% in 2005, and it's actually uh, probably a few percentage points higher at this point by conservative standards. So, living standards. Or where did the uh, constant supply of protesters come from? Although accompanying social polarization are uh, deteriorating uh, living standards that result uh, from economic reforms that have abruptly removed also, I said although, but it's also, which means I should read it again because I didn't know where I was going with that. Also accompanying social polarization are deteriorating living standards that result from economic reforms that have abruptly removed state social welfare support mechanisms, privatized state industry, devalued the currency, and exposed an already vulnerable labor class to market forces. These policies have either worsened their condition or done little to improve, to improve it. With regards to consumer prices and spending, ERSA policies have had a multi-pronged effect by reducing state food subsidies the immediate cost of food to consumers, to every single Egyptian, rose considerably. Cuts to oil subsidies increased transportation and production costs that in turn increased the cost to the consumer on all commodities. The devaluation of the Egyptian pound also raised energy prices, which led to an increase in imported commodities and the cost of domestic production. <clears throat> While finally, high inflation, which was uh, not alle alleviated by reform, further eroded consumer purchasing power uh, dramatically. Added to this is the rise of private sector employment whose workers receive considerably lower wages and benefits. The confluence of reform measures and their unintended si side effects, consumer su subsidy cuts, rising commodity prices, and rising inflation have combined to worsen the living standards of most Egyptians. To the point where we've gotten to a point in Egypt where in 2005, as I'll say, as I conclude in a couple of minutes, uh, where uh, it became almost unbearable to most Egyptians in 2005. So we're talking about five years after that kind of threshold. And these things cannot be um, uh, measured. Uh, and that's why revolutions cannot be predicted. ERSA policies have not only increased the costs consumers must pay on existing goods, but have added new costs as a result of state budget cuts to public services, costs that affect every single Egyptian family, especially uh, the disadvantaged ones economically. After the 52 revolution, education became free and universally available, as many of you know, while healthcare was similarly expanded to benefit all citizens. However, beginning as early as the 1980s, World Bank the World Bank began, began advocating cost recovery measures to reduce budgetary waste, enhance efficiency, and encourage reinvestment in improved services. In practice, this meant changing, charging user fees for education as a means of discouraging not so serious students, and I quote, from wasting precious resources and putting pressure on the educational administrators and teachers to improve the internal running of the educational system. The result was a regressive, was regressive as the, the result was regressive as the poor paid a considerable burden for private education. One estimate claims that private tuition accounts for nearly 20% of a poor household's budget. There is also a secondary issue of mandatory tutoring, whereby <coughs> teachers, as a way to add to their meager income, 
pressure students to take additional private lessons while charging students summary fees for lecture notes, examination guides, or even the examination itself, all of which further increase education costs and strain family budgets <coughs> in significant ways. A similar situation is occurring with regards to the healthcare, to healthcare as user fees have increased the burden on poor families or discouraged them from seeking treatment something that we see the effect of in, in Egyptian popular culture in terms of films or, or, or sitcoms and, uh, and so on. In the rural areas, land reforms and the abrupt introduction of market forces that have raised the cost of land, rents and inputs, combined with the fall in commodity prices, have led to higher rates of rural indebtedness. This in turn has compelled many families to remove children from school in order to reduce expenses as early as the 1990s. This in turn has compelled many families to um, and, and s removes children from school and sell off family assets such as jewelry and more importantly livestock. While such steps may have may be uh, may alleviate short-term problems in the long run, the effects were self-defeating. Without education, young people have virtually no chance of improving their status. While selling off livestock puts farmers at a significant disadvantage. Many resort to sharing livestock, but this still results in decreased productivity and a host of other outcomes. Lacking the help of state support mechanisms, these farmers are left with few options but to, strat but to strategize for the long term, for the short term. They simply cannot afford to plan for the future, and this also produces its own effects that are uh, deleterious for the economy and so on. Because economic reforms were implemented with the primary goal of transforming Egypt into a free market economy, quote unquote, vital state functions were abandoned or curtailed and have had a profound impact upon society, which I uh, have discussed a bit, but it's actually uh, much more severe than that if you look at the, at the, at the forest. Macroeconomic conditions may have improved a bit, but in terms of um, some indicators, and Egypt was considered the, one of the best places to do business just in 2008. It just gives you a sense of how there's this bifurcation between what's happening on the ground and what uh, certain institutions, IFIs and patron countries are interested in, and in terms of numbers and quantifiable things. <clears throat> Macroeconomic conditions may have improved, but for society as a whole, the situation remains precarious or remains precarious. While in the pre-reform era, living conditions may have been strained, there still existed a semblance of a social safety net that could alleviate some conditions of poverty and mitigate polarization. Because of, I'm skipping a lot because I would like to conclude and leave some time for uh, Q&A. Because of the deterioration of the social safety nets and welfare sources, resources, workers are much more vulnerable to, sh to shocks such as unemployment resulting from privatization policies, illness, disability or death, from budget cuts to public health care. Enough people in Egypt have experienced all of the above by 2005, which is a very scary prospect. And between 2005 or 2005-2006 and, and last year, when the, um, uh, the numbers were calculated, uh, more than six to 7,000 protests have taken place, depending on how you would uh, uh, basically identify a protest, workers' protests, all over Egypt at various levels at different times. And of course, what we are seeing today for us is, is new. You know, we're watching this really fascinating uh, picture, but I was in Egypt last year, and many of you have been following probably. This uh, is a culmination of uh, various sort of microcosms of protest throughout uh, Egypt. Economic reform sought to transform the Egyptian economy from a state-managed system to a free market, export-oriented economy. This was always the ideal. Absent from the agenda was economic development, which uh, would have sought improvements to agriculture and, and manufacturing productivity, alleviation of poverty and employment, and broad-based economic growth that benefits most Egyptians. As a result, economic gains resulting from reform measures have not benefited uh, society or even a significant, any portion, any significant portions of it. Rather, reform has diminished living standards considerably for the average citizen and has failed to address chronic problems of poverty and unemployment leading to uh, social polarization and massive gaps between haves and have-nots. A cliche, but you know, we also are seeing something on the, on the TV. Uh, set that that might also be a cliche so I'm, I'm i'm not sure if 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 it's good enough to dismiss things as cliche when it comes to these 
uh, things such as gaps between rich and poor. It also led to the creation of a huge gap, again, between rich and poor, leading to the kind of social polarization that produces deep and widespread instability one day. But, you know, uh, the day has come at least in, in, in a couple of places in the region. So I'll conclude. Uh, though economic factors do not, in and of themselves, explain the outcome we are witnessing, as Hanna Batato used to say in class and in his books, and in class probably down here, just a few feet, we cannot adequately understand this outcome without paying a good deal of attention to such factors. My concern is that what I just discussed might not be part of the lessons learned, whatever the outcome of these Arab uprisings. Thank you.